Buonasera, eh, grazie molte per essere con noi oggi in una giornata logisticamente complicata eh, a Roma per ovvi motivi. È veramente un piacere per me darvi il benvenuto da parte eh, della Fondazione Team alla lecture di questa sera in, in un posto così bello e in un'occasione così particolare quale quella di questa eh, bellissima mostra e celebrazione legata alla storia di Olivetti. Io sono Alberto Mingardi, sono il vicepresidente eh, della Fondazione Team e in quanto tale, come tutti i vicepresidenti, sono eh, sostanzialmente inutile, è una caratteristica eh, del eh, ruolo. Eh, però ho il grandissimo piacere di darvi il benvenuto e di ringraziare il team della Fondazione, a cominciare dal dottor Teoducci, il suo direttore generale, la dottoressa Ciriaci, che molto si è adoperata per la buona riuscita eh, di questo evento, perché eh, quest'oggi abbiamo deciso di, di proporvi una conferenza importante e particolare di un ospite di assoluto rilievo, qual è il professor Ghigherenze. Il professor Ghigherenze si occupa di psicologia, di scienze cognitive, ha molto studiato il ruolo eh, delle euristiche e eh, della razionalità limitata, è un grande critico del paternalismo eh, libertario, eh, dottrina nella quale è assai più importante dell'aggettivo è il sostantivo e eh, per questa ragione mi fa veramente piacere che abbia potuto essere con noi oggi e lo ringrazio molto. Ringrazio molto il professor Gilberto Corbellini eh, che assieme al professor Luca Enriquez, alla dottoressa Francesca Pasinelli e alla professoressa Fiorella Costoris forma il comitato scientifico della fondazione. Eh, Gilberto oltre ad essere un amico è eh, una delle voci più importanti nella divulgazione scientifica nel nostro paese non voglio farlo sentire vecchio, ma non da oggi, ecco, in questo eh, in senso eh, indubbiamente veritiero e nessuno meglio di lui può presentarci il professor Ghigherenzer, motivo per il quale, ringraziandolo anche per averci aiutato non solo in questa occasione, ma anche più volte in precedenza, a definire proprio il profilo della Fondazione rispetto alle sue attività di divulgazione scientifica, di eh, education a più largo scopo, di ehm, cultura dell'innovazione, come l'abbiamo eh, chiamata. Ecco, ringraziandolo per questo e per la sua presenza questa sera, gli cedo subito la parola. Grazie, grazie Alberto, e, eh, grazie anche perché mi hai eh, chiesto di fare questa introduzione, quindi io ho avuto modo di constatare che il professor Gerd Gigerenzer esiste veramente perché io lo, lo leggo e lo studio da molti anni ma non l'avevo mai incontrato di persona e quindi è stato veramente piacevole, è piacevole insomma, mi fa molto piacere introdurre la sua, la sua conferenza. Il professor Gigerenzer è direttore del Max Planck Institute for Psychological Research a Monaco E, e prima di eh, assumere questa posizione è stato professore in diverse università, tra cui Monaco, Costanza, Salzburg, Chicago, è stato professore alla School of Law della University of Virginia e dal 2008 è anche eh, al Harding Center for Risk Literacy in, a Berlino. E inoltre Button Fellow alla uh, Darden Business School, alla Darden Business School della University of Virginia ed è fellow della Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences e dell'Accademia Tedesca delle Scienze Leopoldina. Come ha accennato uh, Alberto poco fa, uh, il professor Gigerenz è a mio giudizio, io faccio anche un po' lo storico, insomma l'autentico interprete della ricerca del premio Nobel Herbert Simon sulla, razional sulla razionalità limitata e sulla, uh, uh, sui vantaggi che ci sono a capire le strategie cognitive collocandole in un orizzonte ecologico ed evoluzionistico. Uh, il uh, 
contributo diciamo, del, del professor Gigerenzer è stato quello di far vedere che non sono tanto la struttura o la consistenza logica diciamo, di una, di una, di una diciamo, eh, di una conoscenza, di una struttura della conoscenza, ma sono piuttosto la funzione adattativa e il suo successo che eh, rappresentano diciamo, la centralità per i meccanismi cognitivi che vi sono implicati. In diversi eh, articoli che ha scritto ha eh, diciamo, eh, invocato, ha chiesto una sorta di rivoluzione eh, nel modo di pensare il funzionamento della mente umana e, e secondo me questa rivoluzione che ha anche delle basi neuroscientifiche molto serie eh, consiglia di, eh, di eh, smetterla di pensare alla mente umana come onnisciente e come in, in coinvolta fondamentalmente a calcolare delle complicate probabilità eh, eccetera ma piuttosto come a una mente che è eh, come dire, limitata che ha delle capacità limitate e che attinge a una cassetta degli attrezzi in cui sono eh, ridistribuite una serie di euristiche veloci e frugali per prendere delle decisioni in diversi contesti, soprattutto in contesti dove eh, non siano prevedibili, diciamo, in dove ci si trova con, in situazioni che non potevano essere prevedibili. Quindi questa idea della cassetta degli attrezzi adattativa eh, per i processi decisionali eh, della mente umana che eh, diciamo, eh, si trovano distribuite, queste diciamo, strutture, queste, queste strategie cognitive specializzate si trovano distribuite in diversi domini diciamo, del eh, pensiero umano, sono in realtà la caratteristica della nostra mente piuttosto che essere questa dotata di un'unica strategia eh, universale. Uh, insieme alla ricerca sulle euristiche, accanto alla ricerca sulle euristiche, il professor Vigherenz ha studiato la comunicazione del rischio in situazioni dove i rischi sono di fatto calcolati e sono anche stimati in modo preciso e ha sviluppato anche in questo caso un approccio ecologico per insegnare il ragionamento bayesiano e la comunicazione del rischio basandosi fondamentalmente per la comprensione e quindi per superare una serie diciamo, di ostacoli cognitivi che vi possono essere a un eh, incontro fra la dimensione cognitiva e la modalità di presentare l'informazione in un dato ambiente e usando questo metodo va ricordato che il professor Gigherenz e il suo gruppo riescono a insegnare ai ragazzi di 10 eh, anni circa a fare inferenze probabilistiche corrette. Quindi l'idea che l'informazione data in, eh, in termini di frequenze naturali piuttosto che in, in termini di probabilità condizionali possa migliorare il ragionamento bayesiano è addirittura diventata parte integrale dell'evidence based medicine, cioè le scuole di medicina oggi in giro per il mondo utilizzano l'approccio suggerito da, dal professor eh, Gigerenz, il quale tra l'altro ha, ha insegnato, eh, diciamo, la, la, diciamo, alfabetizzato sulle modalità di comunicare e, eh, e, 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 e valutare i rischi, eh, migliaia di medici e anche eh, diverse decine di giudici federali negli Stati Uniti, perché mh, anche nell'ambito della giurisprudenza il problema di come gestire insomma, le probabilità è un tema di grande interesse, soprattutto nel, nei, nei, diciamo in, in, in contesti e in società come le nostre. Eh, vado a finire eh, ricordando che un paio di mesi fa il professor Gigerenzer ha rilasciato un'intervista a, una, eh, a una, una rivista eh, tedesca, eh, Tagenspiegel, in cui gli veniva chiesto di commentare quello che sta accadendo in Cina, ovvero il programma di introdurre un sistema di crediti sociali eh, in una forma di gioco che sostanzialmente finisce per premiare i bravi cittadini e penalizzare quelli cattivi, dove in fondo essere bravi o essere cattivi viene giudicato sulla base delle frequentazioni sociali, dei tipi di libri che si leggono, dove si abita, eccetera. E ehm, commentando appunto su questo tipo di situazione e, eh, e anche diciamo, su quello che sta avvenendo in Cina, eh, il professor Gigherenza diceva quello che sta accadendo è che il valore dell'essere umano sta cambiando, nel senso che noi viviamo sempre più in un mondo dove eh, i giudizi vengono rimpiazzati da numeri. 
eh, e dove quindi i, le, 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 diciamo, i livelli, le modalità di calcolare eh, i valori delle persone sono basati su algoritmi. Noi siamo in questo momento ancora nelle condizioni di poter discutere questo tipo di situazione e dobbiamo introdurre anche un'analisi, una riflessione sui valori, perché se non lo facciamo un qualche giorno una compagnia privata o un'istituzione politica metterà insieme tutti i vari database che ci sono in un singolo sistema diciamo, di ranking eh, basato su un, una sorta di credito sociale e alla fine ci troveremo in una situazione che potrebbe essere non troppo diversa da quella verso la quale si sta andando in Cina. E continua ancora il professor Gheghe la politica eh, sta facendo cose importanti per promuovere eh, lo sviluppo dei database, i sistemi digitali, l'intelligenza artificiale, ma sta ignorando completamente le dimensioni psicologiche e sociali di queste tecnologie. Noi eh, parliamo molto della tecnologia, ma parliamo poco di che cosa la tecnologia ci fa, fa a noi, e è necessario diciamo, che questo dibattito venga affrontato qui e ora, perché se non facciamo nulla la tecnologia alla fine ci guiderà. Beh, io credo di aver parlato anche troppo, quindi lascio la parola al professor Gigerenzer che ci parlerà di eh, rischi, biases and good decision, come eh, affrontare l'incertezza e la misinformation. Thank you. At the beginning of the 20th century, the science fiction author Herbert George Wells made the following political prediction. If we want an educated citizenship in a modern democracy, we need to teach everyone three things. Reading, writing, and Statistical thinking, that is, how to deal in a rational way with risk. How far did we get today, almost 100 years later? We have taught almost everyone reading and writing, but not statistical thinking. A news speaker at an American TV program once announced the weather in the following way. There is a 50% chance of rain on Saturday, he said. And there is a 50% chance of rain on Sunday. Therefore, he concluded, there is a 100% chance of rain on the weekend. Now, do you know what it means so speaking to the weather today, what it means if you find on your smartphone the prediction that tomorrow is a 30% chance of rain. 30% of what? I live in Berlin. Most Berliners believe it means that it will rain tomorrow in 30% of the time, that is seven to eight hours. That's also what most Germans believe. Others think it will rain tomorrow in 30% of the region. So, most likely not where I live. The New Yorkers we have interviewed believe that the Berliners have no idea it means something third, namely, it will rain on 30% of the days for which this prediction has been made. That is most likely tomorrow, not at all. Are people stupid? The problem here is not so much in the minds of ordinary people, but in the lack of training of experts to communicate what they want to say in an understandable way. So, the meteorologists mean what most New Yorkers believe, namely, there will be a minimum of rain 
in 30% of the days for which this prediction has been made. They could say that, hmm? but they haven't learned it. Hmm? And this problem has a very simple solution. Always ask percentage of what? Hmm? It's about the reference class. Hmm? So whether it's about days or regions or time, and if you have some imagination, you can think about many more other reference classes. One woman in Athens, Greece, told us, I know what a 30% chance of rain means. Three meteorologists believe it will rain and seven not. Today, I will invite you into a voyage in our research on risk. And the, I will make the following, so my message is the following. It would be easy to teach most of the public how to understand risk. I just gave you a very simple example. Hmm? You can do this in second grade hmm? and give a few more examples. Hmm? And children will go home and find out that their parents don't understand what a chance of rain means. Hmm? That's an incentive. First, so we have developed a number of tools that's very easy to teach everyone to become risk literate. It's not yet implemented because the awareness lacks. In contrast, many uh, colleagues of mine, particularly in the field of behavioral econo economics, believe or say that first, people don't understand risk, which is partly true. Second, there would be no hope for all of you because allegedly one cannot educate people. Therefore, third, governments have to step in and nudge people in a direction where you really want to go, but you don't even know where you want to go. This is called libertarian paternalism or simply nudging. It's become immensely popular. It is not my vision of a democracy in the 21st century. We don't need more paternalism. We had enough in the last century. We need to dare finally to make people competent so they can make their own decision rather than be steered by others in some directions. So, and the third point I will make today is that uh, in many problems, we need to distinguish between a situation where we can calculate the risk and others where we can't. That's called uncertainty. And we need to extend our tools from statistical thinking to heuristics, simple rules that can be more powerful than the most complex calculations in, say, Basel II or Basel III or other complex regulations. And finally, at the end of our voyage, I will take up the comment here on the uh, scoring systems hmm, on th the world that we have already entered of big data, of algorithms, and that will change us fundamentally, particularly if you don't pay attention. So that's the program. Uh, are you ready? Then we'll start. Uh, the first, first in our voyage will go to England. The, uh, England has many beautiful traditions like the queen, scones, tea, but also the contraceptive pills care. Every other uh, year, the women are alarmed that by taking the contraceptive pill, they increase the risk of a thrombosis, a potentially lethal condition. The most famous care went this way. The uh, British Committee for Safety in Medicines called in an emergency press conference to announce that a study had shown 
that the contraceptive pill of the third generation increases the risk of a thrombosis by 100%. 100%, that's as certain as it can be, isn't it? At least that's what many British women believe. They stopped in panic taking the pill, which led to unwanted pregnancies and abortion, particular among teenagers. How much is 100%? The study had shown that out of every 7,000 women who took the pill of the previous generation, one got a thrombosis, which increased to two out of <laughs> every 7,000 of those who took the pill of the third generation. So the absolute risk increase is from one to two in every 7,000, so one in 7,000, while the relative risk increase is 100%. See? This single news led to an estimated of 13,000 abortions more than usual in the following year in England and Wales. All of this could have been prevented if the public would have ever been taught the difference between an absolute risk, one in 7,000, and a relative risk, frightening 100%. So that's a second example that risk literacy can be easily taught, if it only would. We teach our children in school the mathematics of certainty, algebra, trigonometry, and other beautiful systems that most of you have never used in the rest of your life. And we don't teach what's the most important and useful part of mathematics is statistical thinking. And if it's taught, it's taught in a way that everyone wants just to run away. So, uh, <clears throat> the same uh, trick with relative versus absolute risk is used widely in medicine. So you may remember um, two years ago, the World Health Organization alarmed us that for every 50 grams of a daily doses of sausage or other processed meat, you increase the probability that you will get colon cancer by 18%. Some of my friends, including academics, stopped eating sausage because they thought, yeah, what does it mean? Out of every 100 people, 18 will get colon cancer. But it was the same trick. It was a relative risk. The absolute risk increase was from 5% lifelong chance to get colon cancer if you're not eating too much sausage to 5.9%. But the message that for every 50 gram of sausage on a daily basis you increase your risk of colon cancer by less than one percentage point hmm, wouldn't have caused attention nor alarm. So you represent the increase from 5 to 5.9 as an 18% increase. Then you get the attention. It's a pity that respected societies like the World Health Organization use the same tricks as advertisement. So, uh, <coughs> This was the first part what I wanted to make the following point. The principles of risk communication are fairly easy to learn. Hmm? I guess most of you will now be vaccinated against being misled with relative risks. Hmm? And I would have more time, just try a few more examples, hmm? and then it's done. Hmm? And we could do this, we could make the difference, hmm? but we need to start. And programs like nudging people without educating yeah, are not programs in the service of an educated citizenship. So in our voyage 
<clears throat> I want to invite you to now to another topic about the psychology of risk. And I want to talk briefly about the question, why do we fear what most likely doesn't kill us? So let me see whether that works. Oh, by the way, that's the original advertisement on the contraceptive pills care. And you can see that was the Sunday Times kiss of death. That's the 100%. Hmm? And, the, and it's very clear if they would have reported an increase from one to two in every 7,000, they wouldn't have gotten on the first page. And women wouldn't be alarmed. It also illustrates how lack of risk literacy plays with your emotions. It's like a remote control over your emotions and just translating the uh, risk in a way that people don't understand. So, that's the second question. Uh, <clears throat> I will start with an event most of you still have in mind. It's the 9-11 uh, accident, so the September 11, and you will probably still see uh, those who have been present at this time, most of them still know exactly where they have been. It seems to be that everything has been said about the event, but maybe this is news for you. What did Americans do after the attack? We know that many of them stopped flying. Did they stay home or did they jump in their cars? I have analyzed the traffic statistics and found that for 12 months after the attack, the miles driven increased up to 5%, and particular there where long distance traveling happened in the so-called interstate highways. In that 12 months, an estimated 1,600 people lost their lives, so 1,600 more than usual, in their attempt to avoid the risk of flying. What you see here is the number of fatal crashes uh, every month, so normalized against the months because the, the months, they differ. By the way, do you know in which months is the number of fatal crashes lowest? So the most safe months? No? Does anyone guess? I think a moment. February, yes, hmm? has only 28 days. <laughs> That's why <coughs> this is normalized here. That's about 3,500 at this time. And before 9-11, the uh, numbers, they were going a little bit up and down around the 3,500. And then for 12 months, they were always above the mean, and most of the time, outside of the entire previous five-year range. And then everything went back to normal. That's when the pictures weren't shown anymore. Terrorists strike twice. The first time with physical force. And that's where our attention goes. But the second time, with the help of our brains, of our anxieties. What is the anxiety that terrorists remote control in us. I call it, uh, <clears throat> this is dread risk. So a dread risk is a very specific kind of risk, namely a situation where many people die in a short time, like um, plane accidents or 9-11. It is easy to elicit anxiety in such a situation. 
And note, it's not about dying. Because if exactly as many or, the more, or more people die distributed over the year, as in car accidents or smoking, it's very hard to make us anxious. So it's about social dying. That's the big point. And this may have been a rational reaction in the historical past of humankind, where uh, you know, groups of small groups were wandering around, and the sudden death of a large part of the group could endanger the rest, but it's no longer re relevant today. But it's easily being elicited. And just think about you know, swine flu, bird flu, and all the other catastrophes that never happened here. But we were very anxious about that. Or mad cow disease. Some of you may remember how we hesitated uh, biting into a steak because we feared. By the way, do you know how many people died on the consequences of mad cow? So Kreuzfeld Jakob person in all of Europe in 10 years? What do you think? About 150. That's all. Do you know a cause of death that also caused 150 people in 10 years in all of Europe during the same time? It's the drinking of perfumed lamp oil. Nobody cares. Who does this? Children who have parents that like a certain uh, illumination and it looks like lemonade. So the, there was an attempt uh, to have a regulation that puts labels, warning labels on that. It took an endless time. All the attention went to mad cow disease. And so imagine if this 150 children would have died on one day, hell would be loose. Then we would have a threat risk. So this is just one example about how our anxieties function. And also a good example how it's being manipulated from outside. And it gives you a chance after first year anxiety is elicited to use the rest of your brain and say, not this time, I'm still flying. And I don't want to be among the next 1,600 who die on the roads in the attempts of flying. Do you know, by the way, how safe flying is compared to driving? So assume you want to get from Rome to Berlin. And you have, on, have a choice between flying and driving. And you have only one goal, to arrive alive. So which is more safe? Put it precisely. How many miles or the kilometers would you have to drive with a car so that the risk of dying is the same as with a non-stop flight? Again, how many miles or how many kilometers do you think you have to drive so that the risk of driving is the same as a non-stop flight? Does anyone dare to make an estimate? So I have had experts guessing a thousand kilometers, 10,000, three times around the globe. The best estimate is 20 kilometers. That is, if you arrive safe with your car at the airport, the most dangerous part of your travel is probably already behind you. <laughs> Recently, I had a group of executives of a major um, company, 
and they told me that there are five of them, they're not using the same plane, plane when they fly to the same company, but they're using the same car to get it. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> nevertheless, People fear terrorist attacks. And this is an example about uh, a survey in the US, what Americans fear. And what you can see here is, besides government corruption, that's a big issue in the US, the next one is terrorist attack on the nation. That's about 40% fear that. Then. Um, also victim of terrorism. In Germany, it is more likely to be killed by lightning than by terrorists. In the US, it's more likely to be shot by a toddler than by a terrorist. Beware of toddlers, if you want that. And you should also, that might amuse you, gun control. So 38 people fear gun control. Not what you think. They fear gun control. Mm -hmm. They want free access to weapons. Mm -hmm. so. so this is just an illustration about uh, why we fear things that don't kill us. And also part of risk literacy, all the emotions that are aroused in us and that uh, are used like a remote control of your, your own emotions. So let's go on in our voyage and now on political measures, how to deal with the problem of that people fear the wrong things, are risk illiterate. And there are basically three approaches. One is hard paternalism, regulation. So you forbid something, you don't allow anything. The second one is soft paternalism, nudging. I mentioned that. Nudging is not uh, regulation, it's also not incentives, but it uses the well-known techniques of marketing, advertisement, to steer you where someone else, a so-called choice architect, wants you to have. None of these two paternalisms uh, actually um, ed help to educate or to make increase the competences of people. The alternative that I'm uh, trying to stand for is risk literacy. And you have already gotten a few examples. And I will go with you now through the three options for a very specific a medical system that uh, every woman will be exposed at one time, it's cancer screening, so breast cancer screening. The first version, heart paternalism, uh, has been in enacted uh, in uh, some governments where uh, women have been, at least women typically who are in the state business, they are it's mandatory that I uh, do mammography screening, otherwise they're not getting certain benefits. The uh, second one, nudging, has been always, even before the term was invented, used. So nudging is not regulating, it's not incentives, it's just pushing people. And here is a poster from the American Cancer Society in the 1980s. And if you read that, it says, if you haven't had a mammogram, you need more than your breast examined. That would not go through today. But this was the way one used to talk to women. And <clears throat> so there is no information here about benefits or harms. These women cannot make an informed decision they're just told or insulted in order to go there. And the, I 
<coughs> direct the Harding Center for Risk Literacy, and we design tools so that everyone can understand the benefit and harm of mammography screening. That's now risk literacy. He, uh, before I get to this, now let's, let's get first to the tool here. It's called a fact box. The fact box summarizes the uh, medical evidence from studies, randomized trials with about 500,000 women. But it breaks it down. And it doesn't use any relative risk, hmm, but only absolute number. So what you can see here, 1,000 women age 50 who don't go screening and 1,000 who go screening. And the question is, what happens 10 years later? And what's the benefit? And not only the benefit, but also the harms. And the goal is not to nudge or to regulate but to give the information that everyone can make her own decision. That's the point, an informed decision. So I go you, with you quickly through benefits. There are two kinds. Is there a reduction of breast cancer mortality after 10 years? Yes. So about five in the no screening group die and four in the screening group. That's one in thousand, uh, absolute risk. If you wanted to mislead women, how would you present that as a 20% risk reduction? Uh? And we'll see in a minute that's being done. Then more important is the total cancer mortality because one is not always sure. For instance, if a person has multiple cancer, what is the cause? So, and here there is no difference. This information is withheld to this day eh, in most pamphlets because the pamphlets are not written that uh, women can make an informed decision, but to get them, to nudge them into screening. Then there are two kinds of harms. These are women with no uh, cancer, it's false positive biopsies, roughly 50 to 200, so that's uh, quite a chance within 10 years. And here, this is, uh, these women have only harm, so these are women with a, a form of breast cancer that is non-progressive. That means they would never notice anything during their lifetime. And, but mammography detects it, so they get lumpectomy or other treatments. And, sorry, and uh, that's the back. Hmm. And uh, an estimated two to 10 uh, go through that. These are unlucky women who believe that the treatment saved their life. Hmm? But they would be better off if they wouldn't have gone there in the first place. So that's a fact box. These fact boxes, you can find them in our website. They're for many conditions, knee operations, drugs, or whatever. And these fact boxes should be at every doctor's office. But what do you find in the doctor's office? Cosmopol cosmopolitan, yeah, car uh, journals, and other things huh, that have nothing to do with your health. So I'll give you now an example how the information is communicated and in a typical uh, brochure. And you might look in your own brochures. And you will, I would bet you won't find this information there. And you will probably find very little here. The only thing that's communicated is here, the five to four. But how is this communicated? These are examples from a certain number of uh, uh, pamphlets. So the Welch NHS leaflet breast says, breast screening has been shown to reduce the risk of dying from breast cancer by around 35%. So that's the 20%, rounded up to 35. And most women will think, oh, out of 100, 35, life will be saved. No, no. 
it's one out of thousand. And there's no life saved. It's just one of, out of thousand who dies with a diagnosis, breast cancer. While one more dies with another diagnosis, as we just have seen here. Yeah? And you can see uh, here it's 33%. Um, that's a, a more recent development that uh, we and others have argued for long. Yeah? Stop misleading patients with relative risk. So then uh, for a phase, absolute risk were uh, shown, but not one in thousand, but we rounded up to five in thousand, the equivalent of one in 200. That's now being stopped. It takes a long way in medicine that the results of medical studies are honestly and understandably communicated to doctors and patients. That's the situation in medicine. This is why you need think yourself and not just trust because there's too much business and money in that. So here's an example, another example about risk literacy program. So the German Chancellery has a group that uh, translates our techniques on making people risk literate, not to nudge them. And a key problem is that doctors don't wash their hands always hmm? and that causes infection and death. Hmm? In Germany, we have an estimated, so all together, so the, uh, one of the German health insurers estimates about 18,000 people die every year in German hospitals from avoidable uh, errors that include not hand washing. Huh? This is a very rough estimate. It just can only serve as a very general thing. Now, nudging would mean that you have uh, put, for instance, eyes, uh, pictures of eyes over the place where you could hand wash and then nudge the one, oh, I have to hand wash. Huh? I would bet that will not last very long. Hmm? Um, risk reduction means to increase the competences and that team went into many of the um, hospitals and worked together with the doctors a program that was the doctor's program. So the situation was something like this. The doctor said, of course, we are all washing our hands. It's the nurses who don't. Eh? And the nurses were the opinion, it's the opposite. Eh? So they resolved that and introduced an error culture hmm, behind which everyone is standing and part of it, and you can find uh, at the internet, if you go into this, the details, and this type of uh, interventions have a better promise to be sustained for a long time, while a nudging program may end the moment nobody is nudging anymore. Hmm. So, let's go on with our topics to the topic of fake news. And fake news, as you may have seen, is not really anything new. We always had them. It's just the technology allows it in a different way. And also I want to make the point that fake news are not only distributed by Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. It's not only those who we might think are the bad guys, it's the good guys too. And I just saw some examples. So uh, here is my first example. You may have heard of the recent Facebook scandal. And here is an ad that has been paid for by a Russian account in 2016 to influence the US elections. And it says it's a kind of fight between Satan and Jesus Christ. 
And Satan says, if I win, Clinton wins. And Jesus, not if I can help it. And then press like to help Jesus win. You need to know that a large part of the American public is religious and they're on the side of Jesus automatically. And it appeals to religious people. And the key problem is, that's a particular kind of fake news. You need to really believe huh, that um, there is Satan and in a fight with Jesus. But here is something uh, more Here is. Huh? Here, let's take the US government. You may remember a few years ago, there were news <coughs> uh, that big data could save, or actually has saved, hmm, people from terrorist attacks because it has identified and trans. Um, uh, and and prevented these attacks. Many of these news are now also fake news. So it's not just Trump. Here uh, are some examples. The uh, FBI ignored reports about radical Arabs who wanted to learn how to fly a Boeing 767. So the news were there. The information was there. It was attended to. And they also not only wanted to fly one, but they had no interest to learn how to land. That should give you um, an, an idea. <laughs> uh, the Boston Marathon, same thing. It was not big data or anything. The information was there. And finally, Keith Alexander, the head of NSA, claimed that 44 terrorist attack had been prevented by big data. Obama repeated that. And a Congress hearing had to retract that statement. And we don't know how many it was. If it was one, two, or zero, it's unclear. So just uh, want to illustrate the point. It is happening uh, in the selling of big data in the same way and the selling of big data has other causes and motivations, including to make the American public prepared that they're being surveilled. And it's only to protect them against terrorism. Many big data claims are unfunded. There are a few areas where big data helps. Most of the time, it's just advertisement that people believe and a waste of time and money particularly in healthcare, where I do not know any success of big data, but I know that much of the money that should have gone in educating doctors and patients went to the end into big data. That means to uh, IBM or Siemens or others. Here is a famous, famous example about the success of big data. If you have ever read the book Big Data by Victor Schoenberger and Kenneth Kukier, then you have, it starts out with Google Flu Trends. And Google Flu Trends is presented as the big success of big data. And it's a great idea, namely, that you could predict from the search terms that people enter the spread of flu in the US. And I wanted to do it faster than the Center for Disease Control. And that would be certainly a good cause. And it worked for a little time. But then some things happened that were unexpected, like uh, the swine flu came out. And it didn't come in the winter, where flu happens, but in the summer. How could big data know that, being calibrated in five years before, where it's never happened? And then uh, the, for years, the uh, number of people 
who visit doctors, that was the criterion, with flu-related symptoms was overestimated. And finally, in 2015, the entire predictions were buried because they didn't work. So that's the true story. So I give you just one example about the rhetoric and then about the reality, or the fake news. The rhetoric is trumpeted. The burial of the program was silent and quiet. So here is another example. <clears throat> and here now I want to make a slightly different point. There are things we can calculate and predict, and there are things we can't. The first are called risk, and the others are called uncertainty. That's the terminology from Frank Knight and others. The tools for risk is probability theory. The tools for uncertainty is not probability theory, because it's based on certain assumptions that won't hold, but you need smart heuristics here. They make simple rules. In our society, we often confuse situations of uncertainty with those of calculable risk. This confusion is called the Turkey illusion. Why Turkey? Assume you are a Turkey. It is the first day of your life a man enters and you fear he will kill me, but he feeds you. On the second day of your life, the man comes again. You fear he will kill me. No, he feeds you. Third day of your life, same. According to all mathematical models, including Bayesians or other updating models, the probability that he will kill you uh, sorry, the probability that he will feed you and not kill you increases every day a bit. And on day 100, it is higher than ever before. But it's the day before Thanksgiving, and you're dead meat. So the turkey missed an important information. <laughs> it was not in a world of calculable risk. The turkey illusion is probably more often committed by us people rather than turkeys. And um, for instance, the financial, if you think of before 2008, at the, at the prediction of the big financial institutions, including the rating agencies, they were going up and up and up until shortly before the breakdown. For instance, uh, Standard & Poor had an algorithm that could only predict that it's going up because it was calibrating on a certain window where it was only going up. The same thing as the turkey. See that? Uh, here I got you a quote from Robert Lucas, one of the most distinguished macroeconomists, who in his presidential address to the American Economic Society said that, referring to the Great Depression, that the central problem of Depression prevention has been solved for all practical purposes and has, in fact, been solved for many decades. That was in 2003. Four years later, everything was different. So that's another illusion of certainty. And we love them. I work with the Bank of England on developing simple rules for a safer world of finance. There are some addresses here, you can look at that. And the key insight I'll give you with an example from Basel II and Basel III, these are the regulations. If you own a large bank, or be the, in the executive, the large banks you have to calculate your value at risk and that would require um, estimating thousands of risk factors and a correlation matrix in the order of millions based on a window of some years. That's an impossible task. 
and this value at risk calculation have not recognized nor prevented any of the crisis. And this task borders on astrology, but it's still done. The alternative is to systematically study simpler rules that are tuned to the uncertainty and not the, use the mathematics probability theory uh, that's being used that would be fine if banks would play in a casino, but they don't. They play in the real world of uncertainty. I'll give you one example uh, to make the point that in a world of investment, in a world of uncertainty, simple rules can easily match and also often be better than complex uh, yeah, calculations. Assume you have a certain sum of money and you want to invest it. You don't want to put everything in one basket, but to want to diversify. But how? Harry Markowitz from the University of Chicago got his economics Nobel Prize for the solution. That's the so-called mean variance portfolio. I'm not doing mathematics with you today, and the problem is also not calculation, but estimation of all of these parameters. But optimization model, Nobel Prize, so problem solved. When Harry Markowitz invested his own money for the time after his retirement, he used his Nobel Prize winning method. So we might think, no, he did not. He used a very simple intuitive heuristic. We call this one over N. N is the number of assets. <laughs> Clear? If you have two, you do 50-50. If you have three, a third, a third, a third. Hmm? How good is that? So if the assumptions of the Markowitz model would be correct and the future would be known, then the Markowitz model would be the best, optimal. But we don't know whether the assumptions are correct. They're certainly not. Hmm? And the future isn't known. All these estimates, they're all future estimates that need to be done. So here's one study uh, that has been done. One has looked at seven investment problems, like here are 10 American industry funds. And uh, the Markowitz method needs to estimate the parameters and got 10 years of stock data to estimate it. 1 over n doesn't need anything to estimate and you're done immediately. By the way, 1 over n is the opposite of big data. It is zero data, a simple heuristic that doesn't look at the data at all. What was the result? In six out of the seven investment problems, 1 over n outperformed the Markowitz optimization model according to standard criteria like Sharpe ratio. There are now several studies from us and others, and the results are going in both ways. And the real point is to find out in which situation does complex estimation pay and where should one go simple. So I do this here without big um, numbers. So if you are on the left side, if the uncertainty is low, there are few alternatives and high amount of data. That's basically the world of calculable risk here. Yeah? Then make it complex. That's the world of optimization of big data, such as mean variance. But to the degree you're on the right side, where there's high uncertainty, so that means tomorrow is not necessarily like yesterday, there are many alternatives and relative few data that make it simple and go in the other direction. That's the world of 101 and other simple heuristics. So finally, I want to take you into the big problems that we are facing today and start with big nudging. Big nudging is the combination from between nudging and big data. Here are a few. 
and I just take one area, voter manipulation. There are now a number of techniques how to manipulate voters. So the first examples is from experimental studies where one uses a kind of bias in people, search behavior, namely most people only click on the first page. About 90% of clicks are on the first, say, Google page or another website page, and half of them in the first two entries. That's a kind of bias in search. How do you exploit that? You try to get news, positive news about your candidate on the first page and the negative news far behind. Uh, there is a systematic study on the largest democratic votes in India where there were three candidates and search engines were manipulated so that the uh, good news about one candidate in one case was in the front, the other was maybe at page five. Hmm? And so for all of these candidates, and the conclusion in the study was that undecided voters, and of course it only works with undecided voters, that about 20% of undecided voters can be flipped by changing the order of the good or bad news. Hmm? And that's enough for most of the elections to flip it. Huh? The uh, Twitter bots are in the news and the Facebook news are also in the news. I skipped that one. And at the end, I want to uh, say a few words to scoring. As you probably know, you are scored by many agencies, credit scoring. Uh, health insurers score your behavior and many or give you cr uh, discounts on Fitbits so that you get your data and so on and people appear to like like that. Huh? Um, the <coughs> if you have seen the Netflix uh, series Black Mirror, there's an episode about a future world where everyone has a score an Amazon score between ones and five. Hmm? And everyone else constantly scores everyone else. So you would score me during the lecture or at least after the lecture. I would score you. You would score your neighbor because he didn't pay attention or fell asleep or whatever. Hmm? And you would score the photographer. Everything scores everything. Hmm? And as we are doing in Airbnb, or in Uber, uh, it's already happening, or in other things. And in this world, it, the story is about a young woman, Lacey, she has 4.2. And I should say, everyone has a kind of contact lens system where you can immediately see from everyone sitting here, name and score. And you can think about to whom you want to talk and whom to avoid just on the score. Huh? So she has 4.2, she wants to move in a better part of the city, but in order to afford the apartment, she needs a 4.5. Now she does everything in order to increase her score. And it doesn't work well, it goes bad, but watch it yourself and you get the idea about lives that only have to do with your score. That's all. And if you think that's no science fiction, in China, the Chinese government has in 2014 announced a program that I want to complete by 2020, that every Chinese citizen will get a social credit score. Social credit score means that uh, the, the data about everyone, about his uh, financial credit, about his health behavior, about the criminal record, about the entire digital fingerprint hmm, is collected and combined in a single score. It will be probably be, be between 350 and 950. Hmm, and we also know the consequences. So 
if you think that you can stay out there and still uh, look at websites that are about topics you should not look, hmm? then you will learn very quickly that your children will not be allowed to attend the best schools. And you may not be allowed to uh, get on certain trains or planes or out of the country. And it's a program decidedly for increasing the honesty and the trustworthiness of the people. What could be better if you could immediately see whether some person is trustworthy or not? By the way, industry is also scored. And it's a program against corruption and anything. If that will go through and it, there is little doubt, it's just a technical problem to get these data banks together, it will change the mentality of everyone. And it will probably find a kind of, um, that's the, one of the big plans for this system, it will find imitators. And you might think about other absolute governments, like in Korea, could be Putin, Russell, Russia, and certainly the African countries who, where China has done much for, and certainly find a digital form of an absolutist regime that actually can improve the honesty and the trustworthiness and the effectiveness of the entire system and the economic output. That will be a self-runner, and because the Chinese make the score open so everyone can see what the other course is. And also you know, if you talk to people, if you have friends who have a low score, your own score will go down, the social pressure will be enormous and everyone will regulate everyone else. The problem is solved. Now you might think that's China, but it can never happen here. I wouldn't be so sure. And in Europe, the governments most likely will refrain from that, although we know that the British secret services apparently monitor every British citizen's digital fingerprint, but still, but what will, can well happen, it's the industry who will do it. So here's an example about Axiom, a large US data broker who claims to have data on 700 million people, and they, as can you see here, they try to do the same thing, to get the data about every individual from different uh, areas of behavior together in order to coordinate a score. Axiom has a branch in Germany, has hired, a, bought a company that is now, um, uh, has the technology to, to unify these data banks, and given the love of many people with their digital gadgets and the little concern about where the data is going, it may well realize in a different world here too, in an industry way. And if we don't start a discussion about what we want, what future we want and what future we want for our children, it will likely happen here in Italy and Germany too. Only a little bit later and with a different way just by uh, technological firms who drive it. So that was the voyage, I invited you into the world of risk. And here are three key points. We have today lack of risk literacy in health, in wealth, in the digital media. And I gave a few examples that we actually do have the technologies to change something. And by the way, I haven't talked much about that, many experts are equally risk literate as everyone else, particularly in the health domain 
and the financial domain. An estimated 80% of doctors we have studied in Germany in the US do, are not able to read an article in their own field critically and understand the numbers. Second, we face a situation where nudging combines with big data and which is going to influence us more and more. And if we don't do anything here, it will end in a massive surveillance of everyone and in a type of citizen scoring. And at the end, the positive news is risk literacy can be taught. We are teaching thousands of doctors to understand health statistics. I have taught American federal churches to understand DNA evidence. Many of my smart uh, co-workers at the Harding Center for Risk Literacy are teaching patients, doctors, and others to understand evidence. We can do something if only we start. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Ci sono domande? Coraggio. Uh, the social credit you just mentioned in China is something to do with the sesame credit of uh, Alibaba? Yeah. Also, the, in China, uh, Alibaba is involved, Baidu is involved, basically all the big internet companies that correspond to here Amazon or Google. Hmm? And Sesame Credit is a score, but it's limited to financial credit rating. Hmm? And the key, and it will be probably the template for the social credit score. And uh, the, these companies are all working to make it possible. You had to change one thing and one thing only in school curriculum. Yeah. What will you change in order to make it easier for people to become risk literate? Yeah. So one thing would be to teach uh, risk literacy that could be taught as a, a genuine field. Better would be to teach it in every other subject, but then you would really train every teacher. That would be, that's the key problem train the teachers. And so the, the easier alternative would be to have a, a field that teaches how to deal with money, how to deal with health, how to deal with um, digital media, how to control it rather than being controlled, starting in first grade. And, by, and uh, all teach this on concrete example that fit to the age of these children. And with the goal not to tell them, uh, yeah, don't do that or don't do that, but make them strong. Make them strong so that they realize uh, how they're being manipulated when they get into, say, puberty hmm, hmm, later. And that means also to be very careful with their own emotions. Hmm. To, to make it clear, this is something, something imposed on you. This is something that you grow hmm? and you'll be able to see through and act. So that would be the most sustainable program if you can change the schools. Hmm? Uh, it's also the most difficult ones because schools to revolutionize a school is like to move a cemetery. Hmm? And uh, so the... Uh, <laughs> So there, there may be special programs with adults. And particularly, I think, companies could do something. Could do something and in a certain city and think about how you could make something. And uh, uh, many of these topics I brought are interesting, not only for children, for adults. And they are deep to our heart and our future. 
and have people involved and change things. That's what a living democracy should be. Hi, I always keep in asking myself, if I, any one of us could teach some of themselves to uh, super artificial intelligence, just master booting his little part, just having a phone and start teaching something about himself and making this super intelligence uh, like blockchain, like open as the internet. Will this intelligent fight these companies that wants to keep it closed and use it against us? Is that, that's a dream of me. It's like working, every, every one of us working uh, his little part and giving to some supercomputer his little part of being, like uh, emotions, like how do I think uh, the world should be? How do I see the world? But keeping the big uh, brain like um, separated from um, money, from uh, like I don't know, interests, just keeping it open as the internet. Would it be possible for you? So is your question? It's a little bit hard to understand. Yeah? Is the question uh, if there would be a supercomputer or? Shall we build a aim at a supercomputer who can decide everything with no interests? No, no, it, I can understand it much yeah. better without microphone. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. So no one can control it. But it's built by single um, intelligence. I mean, mm -hmm. me, him, yeah. him. Mm -hmm. And everyone is separated from each other. But all data are collected. And all data are making this big, incredible big brain that has a part of each one of us. So it can understand each one of us. It's like uh, talking to God, you know. But if we keep this uh, super intelligent, that's going to be built. I mean, uh, SAI, it's the future. I mean, in 20 yeah. years, 30 <laughs> years, mm. when we'll have uh, uh, quantum computing, that's going to happen. And if someone <laughs> is going to control this, what's going to yeah. happen? So, so your idea is to build a supercomputer for the individuals. Huh? By the way, that's the origin of the computer. So in, <laughs> uh, in, in Babbage's time, so he got the idea of a computer, a mechanical computer from looking at how they computed the, um, in the French Revolution changing to the decimal system, hmm, the logarithms, from a pyramid of people hmm, where only those on the top could actually do math. Hmm. And it's in uh, Feynman's story in the uh, uh, atomic project, the same thing in the Herbert Simon. It's always people who start out. Later, the computer became a machine, and a digital machine. It's just more powerful in, and more faster than the human type of computers. In general, I would respond to my philosophy is since we can never trust with the governments or industry hmm, will do the best for the people, we need to invest directly in people. And that is possible. Hmm? Yeah, we are just investing in technology. And for instance, already in medicine, the doctors don't understand often the technology anymore. Huh? So we need to train the doctors. And in the same way, uh, we need to not just give young people a tablet, like a six-year-old, but we need to do something that they learn to control it rather than being controlled by it. We need to invest as much in people as in technology. In any case, 
I think that biology is different from technology. And the human brain evolved in, <laughs> in a thousand, uh, uh, ten, uh, hundred thousand years, and uh, it's difficult to reproduce. No, sure. it's impossible to reproduce the human brain inside a super intelligent computer. Impossible, technically, I think. Um, I'm not so worried about fake news uh, in itself. I think that uh, during history we had a lot of fake news and people who believed in, that, in, in those fake news. But um, what scares me is the monopoly, the fact that there are some few industries that can have the monopoly of the fake news, and millions of people who are get the news from them. Um, you strongly believe that against this monopoly, the awareness uh, of the fake news or uh, uh, teaching people to know the risk is, uh, is the way, the solution. But uh, you never talked about regulations of this monopoly you know, that maybe can be an alternative, no? Don't you think so? So the, uh, if I understand it rightly, it's an acoustic problem here on the stage. It's very hard to hear what's on. Um, the, I think that we should start investing in people. And we have at the same time so many other programs that are against it. For instance, the behavioral economist view that you are risk illiterate, there's no hope for you, therefore the state must go in. Yeah? Or many of the claims made by AI and big data that uh, humans can be dispensed with hmm? and we don't need them anymore. Uh, we can replace them by algorithm. For instance, uh, the PR de uh, department of IBM markets IBM's Watson with incredible claims and on which, for instance, N.H. Anderson, one of the most respected cancer clinics in the U.S., uh, started a collaboration with Watson, invested 62 million only to find out that Dr. Watson is not better than any normal doctor and probably worse. Uh, or uh, the, there is the con consents program that is used to uh, predict whether a defendant will commit a crime in the next two years. It has been applied to a million Americans. And apparently very few ever ask, is it better than a church? It turned out, now is the first study, it is not better than an ordinary person who has no idea about recidivism. And these were Amazon truck workers who got one dollar for working on 50 problems, on 50 real cases. You can imagine how much care they took. So what I want to say is that by uh, these kind of forces, the danger is that we uh, stop uh, putting effort in training people and experts because we believe somehow that we have now an algorithm that can solve that. So that would mean that we just, uh, there are now predictive algorithms for where in a city the next crime will happen. I have not seen any evidence that this is better than an experienced policeman, but the danger is that policemen will rely on that and sit behind their screens and no longer know something about the areas in which they should work. Or a church may rely more and more on an 85 probability for you committing another crime than using his or her own brain and experience. And so we losing out if we believe in algorithms which 
have not been under quality control. And what amazes me lots is that so the little thought that it's being given on uh, quality control on asking, you know, I want to see evidence that whatever big data application is better than what we already have. Mm. And uh, this is typically not the case. As I mentioned before, IBM has not published a single article I know on what Watson can do. In particular, you need to know whether he can do anything better than what's being done. And here's another danger, that we surrender to algorithms, believing that it would be good, uh, and not even asking for evidence. I have not seen, there are certain uh, problems where AI works very well, and it's mostly problems where tomorrow is like yesterday, of this type. And uh, there's no question, in particular, also big data works very well in predicting our, the past but not necessarily in predicting the future. And predicting the past means surveillance, finding out what you've done. And here, it, this is its prime uh, ability to do. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Professor Gigerenzer. Il nostro tempo è finito, quindi grazie a tutti. Eh.